Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I think my task for today is uh, to set you on a path to understanding a little bit more what is reinforcement learning. And my personal objective will be to try to tease apart in what way reinforcement learning is different from supervised learning. I'm assuming most of you are very familiar with supervised learning. And it turns out there's some interesting subtleties about reinforcement learning, which we'll explore. And we'll talk also about um, deep Q networks, DQN, which have been much in the press in the recent year for success on solving various games from Atari to uh, Computer Go. Um, and uh, if all goes well, we'll do all that this morning. And then in the next session, Peter Abiel will come and give you a sense of a different class of families for RL, which deal more with searching over the policy space. So let's get started. I'm starting quite from the basic um, because I seem to get the feedback that a few of you were not familiar with RL at all. So bear with me if you know all of the basic. Hopefully, there will still be some interesting bits a little bit later on. Um, the main goal of reinforcement learning is to um, deal with agents that have to learn a sequence of actions. So right away, a really important element is that you can't assume that your choice of action is going to be independent at each time step. There's this notion that there's a sequence of decisions that need to be made, and there's some dependencies between these um, choices. And so usually we assume that information from the environment is captured in a notion of state, and that there's a notion of a reward. And so that's a feedback signal that tell us how well we are doing in terms of our choice of actions. And over time, through exposure to examples, the agent can somehow statistically estimate the relationship between the choices of actions in certain states, and how is that related to reward. And in particular, the quantity we seek to optimize in this case is the sum of rewards over the lifetime of the agent or over the lifetime of the task of the agent. So we write down the expectation over a particular policy pi. Pi is the strategy that the agent is choosing, the strategy the agent is using to choose these actions. So we're taking the expectation over this policy and we have an argmax argument over here. That expression means we want to find the policy that maximizes that expression. So we're looking at the sum of rewards. And that framework is somewhat inspired by some of the early work in um, psychology, going back to Pavlov, who sort of laid out some of the conceptual ideas from that. But it was formalized mathematically in the late 50s by Bellman, and more recently by Ritz Sutton and Andy Bartow in the late 80s. There's a large spectrum of applications of reinforcement learning. Most of the applications we're hearing about in recent years have to do with games, solving games. Um, but it turns out there's many other interesting problems in robotics, for example, where people have been using RL to optimize the sequence of choices for the robotic agent, as well as in optimizing um, treatment design, in particular for chronic diseases where it's not just a question of choosing treatment A versus treatment B, but there's really a notion that you have to change the treatment over time as the disease progresses. So for many years, sort of the biggest success of RL was really the system called TD Gammon, which was developed by Jerry Tassaro in the mid-90s while he was at ABM. And TD Gammon was quite interesting in that it was an example where an RL algorithm trained, in this case, by playing games against itself actually learned how to reach a level of play that exceeded that of the best human players. And the reward function was very, very simple. Right? The agent would play the game, so pick a sequence of actions, and at the end, it would receive a feedback of either it won the game and then got a reward of plus 100, or it lost the game and then it got a reward of minus 100. But for all the intermediate time step, the agent received no feedback, no supervision about how well it was doing. And so that's a very, very sparse signal in terms of our loss function. If you compare it to supervised learning, every time you're presented with an example, you see an object, you predict that this is a dog, and if it's not a dog, you know right away. In this case, the agent may take dozens of actions before knowing whether it wins or loses. And it doesn't have direct feedback on which of these actions along the way was crucial to winning or losing. So it needs to learn that aspect directly from the data. In this case, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the architecture later once I've built up a little bit more of the formalism. Um, but perhaps it's interesting to know that it was actually playing 1.5 million 
sorry, <laughs> the 10 to the 6 and the million are redundant here. 1.5 million games against itself. Um, more recently, we've had some, we'll see if this video plays. My computer in demo mode has been a little bit difficult about this. Um, results showing that we could actually use reinforcement learning to reach human level play in several Atari games. So in this case, there's an a, emulator for the old Atari console, and we actually train an agent to play these games. And in this case, the little gun firing at the bottom, that's controlled by the RL agent after being trained. So what you're seeing, it's actually playing quite well, and it can do that across several dozens of different games. Now, right now, the RL agent for each of these games are trained separately. Um, and one of the challenges going forward, and there's starting to be a lot of work on this, is how do we leverage what the agent has learned on one game to learn much faster on the other games? There's clear evidence that humans are doing that. We don't yet have the right architectures for our machines to be doing this. And perhaps most famously is uh, the result in the last year, in March of this year, of the AlphaGo system that was deployed by DeepMind in a series of games against the leading Go player. And we all know the outcome of that. Machine did much better than the human player in this. And again, at the core of this was a set of algorithms based on deep learning and on reinforcement learning, the intersection of which is DeepRL and has been really a very hot field in the last year. Um, I want to take a second to really argue for paying attention to RL outside of solving computer games. Um, in our particular group, we've spent a number of years trying to figure out how we could optimize neurostimulation policies for reducing the incidence of epilepsy in people who have epileptic seizure. So in this particular case, the sequence of decisions that we're making relates to how much stimulation and the timing of the stimulation to deliver directly to the brain. And the state that we are observing is real-time EEG information taken from the brain. And so in that case, we've been able to show in an animal model. We don't yet do this on cute babies. Um, we have rats, which can be kind of cute also. Um, we have an in vitro model where we take a slice of the rat brain and put it in a particular preparation. Then we can plug in our recording electrodes. We can plug in our simulation electrode, feed that back to the laptop and the RL algorithm learns and in the end deploys a strategy and we can show that we can actually reduce the incidence of seizures quite effectively by automatically learning from trial and error on this particular case. <laughs> so just to sum up, essentially, you know, there's this question, when should I be using RL versus some other form of machine learning? And here are my few tips. One, you know, you have to be in a situation where your data comes in the form of a trajectory, not independence examples. So we are throwing out this IID assumption, which is so crucial to supervise learning. The second thing is there has to be a notion that the decisions have a sequential aspect also. So we're making a sequence of these choices of actions. Um, we have to be in a case where we have some feedback about the state. It can be <coughs> partial, it can be noisy, it can be delayed all the way at the end like it was in TD Gammon, or it can be at every step of the way where every time you're agent does something, there's someone that says good robot, bad robot. All of these frameworks are allowed. And then perhaps a little bit more subtle, you have to have a sense that there's going to be a gain in terms of learning when you're optimizing that action choice over maybe a portion of the trajectory. There has to be a notion of generalizability. Otherwise, you can just treat the whole trajectory itself as a supervised learning example. And so if you think you can share some information across pieces of the trajectory, then the RL framework provides some useful um, mathematical formalism for handling that. And so in terms of contrasting reinforcement learning versus supervised learning, whereas in supervised learning you have some input, some outputs, and then your training signal is some, comes in the form of some loss function that's expressed after each example. In our L we still have input. Our outputs we usually call them actions, and our training system or training signal we, we usually call a reward. But there's a notion that there's a dependency between the inputs that is fed through the environment. Perhaps it's useful to clarify that I'm going to assume, and most of the RL literature assumes, that time is a discrete quantity. So there's kind of a clock ticking, and in every tick of the clock, the state changes, and an action is taken, and a reward signal is observed. So in this case, at each click of the clock after an action, the environment changes the state, and then the agent gets to see some 
version of that, maybe a full observation of the state, maybe a partial observation of the state, a training signal is expressed. And some of the challenges that we experience in this framework are <laughs> one that we essentially have to solve jointly the problems of learning and planning. When you're dealing with classical planning systems, you assume that the relation between your choice of actions and the effect on your states and your goals are explicitly specified by some language, often some kind of symbolic language. In this case, we don't know that relationship, so we have to learn the effects of our actions. We have to learn when reward it can be gained, um, but we also have to do planning in the sense of picking a sequence of actions. Another important point is that the distribution of your data changes with your choice of actions. So if I have a robot that always, a flying robot that always chooses to go up, then the information I get about the world is going to be of a certain kind. If I have a robot that always chooses to go down, the information I get about the world, the rewards, and my states are going to be different. And so there's an effect between that which we have to take into consideration when we do our learning. We don't assume we have identically distributed data. The distribution over the data changes as a function of the policy. And finally, and perhaps this is the point that has most limited the progress of our L compared to other fields of machine learning, is the fact that you need access to an environment. Most of the work you can't do from just a static batch of data, and we'll discuss this in more detail as we go forward, um, but you essentially need to be able to apply these actions and observe the effect of these actions in terms of the next state, in terms of the reward. Without this, if you work from just a batch of data, you risk through a sequence of action that hasn't been explored in your batch of data. Remember point number two, your data distribution changes. If you try a action strategy that takes you this way, when all of your data was collected from over here, you are going outside of the range of your data set and you really can't do anything. So we need access to the environment to be able to try out your policies, both for learning and for testing purposes. And so for many years, it's a lot harder between research groups to be exchanging environments as opposed to exchanging data sets. I have a robot in my lab. I can't distribute it to labs everywhere so that they can replicate my experiment. And so this has really been very nice, in particular in terms of the Atari simulator. This is finally an environment that can be simulated that we can be transferred quite compactly. So that has really helped the progress of the field, I think, in the last couple of years. Formally speaking, reinforcement learning is cast as a Markov decision process. We have our set of states, our set of actions. The probabilistic effects of those state and actions, our system and as a state takes an action, it goes to the next state. We assume that's described by a probability distribution. We have a reward function. We've talked about this is usually a real number. That reward function, as you see by this graphical model, can be a function both of my current state, my previous state, my previous action. All of these things can factor in. And usually, I'm not going to talk about it m much, but we assume we have some initial state distribution. We're going to condition our learning on this initial state distribution. Um, a key property which we're making use of in this case is the Markov property. I'm assuming many of you have seen it before, but in case this has fallen through the cracks of your learning, um, the Markov property essentially states that any information you need to predict the future is contained in the current state. So there's no advantage when you're trying to predict the state at time t to condition on the whole history of previous states we've visited. The state t at t minus 1 right before contains all the necessary information. And I could add actions in that in terms of conditioning. It, typically for MDP, on the right hand of the equation, we condition on the previous state and action. And on the left hand, you know, we could condition on the whole history of state and actions. And so, but this is a simple Markov property, as have you seen it for Markov chains and then Markov models and so on. And so I mentioned earlier that in terms of um, performance, the metric we're using is really the notion of optimizing the utility of a trajectory over a set of states. So I'm going to define u of t to be the utility of my trajectory starting from state t. And I'm going to talk about two types of um, cases. One of them is what I'm going to call episodic tasks, not just me, the literature calls it episodic tasks. So in an episodic task, we assume that the task has a finite time horizon. So there's a set of time steps, I'll call it capital T, and what we're interested in is maximizing utility over the sum of these rewards from time step one 
to time step capital T, and the utility can also be defined at intermediate time points through the trajectory. So U of T, little t means that it's the utility from some time point in the middle of the trajectory until the end. So this formalism for episodic tasks can be used, for example, for games, an agent that goes through a maze, anything where we know there's a finite length to the trajectory. In contrast to that, we have what we call continuing tasks. And in continuing tasks, we assume that that task can actually go on forever. And so we don't necessarily have a known end time point. That utility may sum until a sequence of rewards till the end of time. And you'll notice a new symbol has appeared. Now I'm introducing gamma. And gamma is what we call a discount factor. And the role of gamma, you'll see, is mathematically speaking, and there's other roles too, but mathematically, if I want to do this infinite sum, it's not going to go so well. We're not going to have a bounded value unless we make sure that there's some conditions in place that the sum is bounded. And so gamma is usually a number less than 1, between 0 and 1, but at least slightly less than 1, such that this particular sum has a finite uh, interpretation. And so what we do with the discount factor essentially is to make sure that information later on, sorry, rewards obtained later on in the trajectory have essentially less importance, because gamma is less than 1, have less importance in the utility than the rewards acquired in the early time steps. And there's sort of two different interpretations why, you know, the one reason we put it in there is because mathematically it's very convenient, it gives us a finite sum. In terms of problem domain, there's a couple interpretations. One of them is you can actually re-express your problem such that there's a probability of dying at each time step, and this is going to be equivalent to having this particular gamma factor. And the other way to think about it is more like in terms of inflation, right? If I offer you $100 today, or I say, well, come back in a year and I'll give you $100. Between these two things, you have related preferences. And depending on the ratio of these preferences, this is what gamma represents in this case. <clears throat> I've talked about the fact that we are aiming to pick actions according to a strategy. So in terms of introducing a little bit of notation, we usually use pi to denote the strategy. In this case, I'm expressing a stochastic strategy. So my policy is going to be conditioned on the state. And I'm going to have a probability of picking every action in every state. But I can also have a deterministic policy. And in that case, the policy is a straight mapping from state to action. The policy is what I'm trying to learn. I don't know this from the onset. And again, I want to find the policy pi that maximizes my expected total reward. Note here that there are many policies. The number of policy is influenced by a couple factors. One of them is the number of actions you have. Right? At every state, you need to consider all of these actions. Another way to think about it is the number of policies you have also depends on the length of your trajectory. And so in general, there's many, many policies that we may need to consider. So this is like a simple case of an MDP. This is an alternate representation from the graphical model that I gave you. And sometimes you'll see MDPs represent in this particular notion, right? Some of you may be in any one of these states. Maybe some of you are unemployed. I won't ask you to raise your hands. Um, some of you are coming from industry. Some of you are in grad school. A few of us are in academia. And in each of these states, depending on what choice of actions you do, you may have an arrow that indicates the transition probability. There's one particular crucial error that's missing in this graph. It hasn't been updated recently. There seems to be a high trend from academia to industry um, that is lacking on this particular graph. I am um, aiming for a world where the decision is to stay in academia for a good while. And so this is the graph I propose today. But you can choose to learn a different graph. So in each of these cases, right, for each, if you wanted to have a full specification of your environment, and when I talk about exchanging environments between lab, this is the type of specification that I'm talking about. You need to have a defined probability distribution out of every state that defines the probabilities of going to all of the other states. And you also need to have a reward. In this particular case, the reward is expressed just as a function of state. Presumably, there's like a plus 10 reward. I'm not giving you the units here. Plus 10 reward for going to industry versus a plus 1 reward for going to academia. Um, and so in some cases, the reward may be just a function of state, but it also could be a function of state and action, depending on what your domain is. The next little piece of um, notation I want to introduce is the notion of a value function. So if we want to estimate a policy, 
We need to have a sense of if policy A versus policy B, how are we going to evaluate them? I've already introduced the notion of utility. Right? Utility is the actual observation of the sequence of reward that you have. The value function is the expectation of that sequence of reward over the policy pi. So if you contrast utility, utility would be just the sum of our, t, our little t up to our big T, whereas the value function is the expectation of that sum for a particular policy. So I'm talking here of the value of a policy, and that value is defined for all of the states in your system. So if we look a little bit more closely at the value of a policy, if we, at top, I just rewrote the expression that I had a little bit earlier. I have my sum of reward. And the, I'm taking you through a little bit of notation because there's some very nice structure in our value function that will be useful for building up the algorithmic knowledge later on. So in this case, at the top row, I have the same expression I had on the last one, right? The expectation over my policy of my sum of reward, given that my state at time t is a particular state s. I'm defining it here for the case of episodic task, finite horizon that go up to time t, but I'll generalize it to the continuous task a little bit later on. In the second step, all we're doing is separating the expectation of the reward at the first time step versus the expectation of the reward for the rest of the trajectory. And the expectation of the reward at the first time step can be gained by just taking expectation over the policy for that immediate reward. So that's the first part of the equation. And then in the second part of the equation, what you have to notice is it's essentially the same as the first line, what I'm calling the future expected sum of rewards. Essentially the same, but I've removed the first term, but I'm still conditioning on the times t. Now I'm going to take the expectation of going from st to st plus 1. To take that expectation, I factor in my policy, I factor in my transition probability. And now the term that you have at the end on the right side looks a whole lot like the term you have at the top. And so you have a recurrence notion here where you can actually define the value at, time, at state s as a function of these expectations and the value at times s plus 1. This is a case of a dynamic programming algorithm, right? My values at state s are a function of my, value, my other values at my other states, and I take the expectation in terms of those other states I can transition to. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah, that should be t plus 1. Sorry. Yes, thank you. And in the second line, should the first term with the expected value be conditioned on s as well? Um, yeah, you should condition on s for that. Yeah, thanks. And that goes away when you, once you take that expectation. Yeah. So now I have the expectation of a policy, and I've rewritten it. And in this case, I've taken introduced the gamma discount factor. So the discount factor is over your future. And so this is the same form of the equation, separating the immediate reward, the future expected reward. But we have the discounting that shows up before the future expected reward. I only need to discount one because the other discounts, the gamma square and so on, are folded into the v at s prime in this particular case. Sometimes my value function is expressed as a function of states, and sometimes we express it as a function of state and actions. And in that case, I just take away the expectation over the policy, and I instantiate it for a particular action in the first time step. So this is what we call Bellman's equation. Bellman's equation comes in slightly different forms and flavors, but it also always has this canonical form of being expressed as a function of immediate reward and future rewards, and the future rewards are expressed using this recursive form. And so what's interesting to notice now is if I express the value of my policy for all of my states, I essentially have a system of equations. And when I fix the policy, I have a system of linear equations. And I have n variables, n equations, where n is my number of states. So I can actually write it as a system of equation. I can solve it in closed form if my number of state is relatively small, and if I have some conditions in terms of the inverse being well behaved. This isn't usually how we solve it, because most of the time the problems we're interested in have too many states for doing that. And so what we usually do is set up an iterative process, take advantage of the dynamic programming form of it, and set it up as an iterative procedure. So in that case, I start with some initial guess of what my value might be at all of the states. It turns out that these iteration algorithms are a lot less sensitive to the initial value than what you might be used to for a training neural network. And for reasons that we'll explain a little bit later, we can just set everything to zero, or you can just set it to the immediate reward.
So once you have your initial guess, then you iterate your Bellman equation. So you update your value function. And so as the value function at state s plus 1 gets updated, so in the next round, the value function at state s gets updated again. You repeat that until some small changes is detected. Usually we look at the maximum change over all of the states for the changes in the value function. What's below some threshold, we stop doing the iteration. So I want you to note this is just an algorithm for policy evaluation. I haven't yet told you how to pick one policy versus another. All I've told you so far is if I fix the policy, this is how you're going to get the estimation of the value function for that policy. We can actually show that this particular procedure is going to converge. I'm doing this in the case where I have all of my states being a discrete set. So our convergence proof, I'm not going to go through all the details of it, but it's relatively simple. Essentially, the important point is that we can show that the difference between the convergence point, the fixed point of my value function, and the, one of the, the kth iteration as I'm doing these iterates, actually depends on the same quantity times my factor gamma. But because gamma is less than 1, I actually have a contraction on that property. So that difference between where my value function is and the optimal value function gets smaller at every point due to this discount factor. So eventually, it's going to go to 0. You are going to be able to learn your value function. And so there's actually a nice correspondence between the value function and the policy. In particular, we use v star to denote the optimal value function. This is the one that has the maximum possible value. That v star is obtained by finding the policy that maximizes the value function. So I've given you a couple ways to find that value function to estimate that v pi. v star is the best the maximization point of that policy. Yeah. Is gamma less than 1 a necessary condition, or could you put some other conditions like contraction of the transition matrix to get the result? You can certainly put some other condition. An easy one is a finite horizon. As long as you have a finite horizon, you have a finite sum. And so, yeah. But gamma is certainly the most convenient one. And, um, and yeah. And so, it, what's interesting to note is any policy that's going to up achieve that value function, we're going to call it an optimal policy. We're going to write that pi star. So v star is optimal value function. Pi star is our optimal policy. And usually, the value function is unique. There's going to be a unique value function, but the policy doesn't need to be unique. It's possible in a state there's two different action choices that both yield maximum value. <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting to note is if somehow you know the optimal value function, so you know v star. And I'm going to assume for now you also know the model, the rewards, the transition, your discount factor. If you know V star, then we can obtain the optimal policy very fast. Right? It's basically one round of Bellman equation. So the complexity of that is linear in your number of actions. It's quadratic in your number of states. If you know the value function, we get the policy. We'll call that essentially for free. Similarly, if you know the policy, if someone hands you an optimal policy, then you can actually extract the, the value function very easily, again, with a single application of Bellman equation. And I've written down here the case both for the stochastic policy and below the case for the deterministic policy. You essentially sub in the policy for your action choice, and you get your value function by one round, again, of Bellman equation. And so this is important because today, when you see reinforcement learning, in the morning, I'm going to talk mostly about value function methods. So these are methods that solve our L by trying to estimate the value function. But the first part of this tells you, if I solve for the value function, then I can compute the policy very easily. In the next session, Peter Beal is going to tell you about policy search method, policy optimization method. So that class of method actually works, spends all the hard work finding the best policy. But once he's found the best policy, he can actually get the value function very easily also. And we will also discuss, I think Peter is going to discuss this, what we call actor critic methods. And they work by simultaneously optimizing the value function and the policy and using essentially one to regularize the learning of the other. But for today, for the first session this morning, I'm mostly talking about value methods. So I've given you an iterative algorithm to estimate the value of a given policy. Now I'm giving you a framework slightly underspecified for finding the best possible policy. 
And that is the following. Let's say I'm going to start with an initial policy. Pick a random guess. Randomly choose what action to do in every state. We'll call that pi zero. And iteratively, we're going to compute v of pi for that policy. Right? Previous slide, I showed you how to do that. This is easy. So I compute the value for that policy. And now I'm going to compute a new policy that's greedy with respect to v pi. So a new policy that improves a little bit better. And how we do that, all the interesting pieces are in that line. That's really one of the things Peter's going to talk about. I'm not going to say a lot more, but I want you to have in mind the generic framework for what we call policy iteration. In the case where we have a discrete set of states and action, this notion of computing a new policy boils down to just a single round of the Bellman equation again. And we're going to iterate until the policy doesn't change. If in two rounds my policy hasn't changed, well, if my policy doesn't change, my value is not going to change either, right? This is a deterministic computation. And so we can stop when the policy doesn't change. In contrast, the value iteration method works on doing similar iterations, in this case, on the value function. So in this case, I start with a, some arbitrary S choice of my value function. And at every round, I'm going to pick as my value the Bellman equation for the case of the best possible action. So if you compare this algorithm to the one I presented for policy evaluation before, the main difference is I've introduced a maximization over the choice of action in my Bellman iteration. And so in this one, at every round, I get a better value function, but I also allow the policy to change. And in this case, I stop when my change in value function is below some threshold. We can show that under some condition, this algorithm is going to converge to the true optimal of value function. I'm going to take a pause and see if there's any quick questions before we move on. Yes? Uh, you're assuming that we move T, which seems to be very unlikely in real-time scenarios, but we need Yeah, let me um, say not very much now and a little bit later on that. But yes, I'm assuming I know T. Or alternately, I'm assuming for the, the way I've described the value iteration algorithm, right? I have my discount factor in there. And so I'm assuming I have a continuing task and I don't worry about what's t. And my termination condition depends on my convergence on my value function. OK. So let me run through a really quick example for those of you who haven't seen value iteration. Um, <clears throat> this is really um, very simple. We have a robot moving around in a grid world. It can't go in the blue box. And it can either end in the minus 10 state. Let's call that you know, down the pit or it can get plus one in a particular goal. And there's some essentially slight noise in the transition model. So if it aims to go from the lower left corner and it takes an action going east, it ends up in the square beside it with 0.7 probability and with 0.1 probability it ends up somewhere a little bit off from that. And I'm going to assume a discount factor of 0.9. So this is my value iteration at the very first round, right? My value function, my Bellman equation says your value is the immediate reward plus some transition probability in the value at the next state. Well, all my states were initialized at zero. And so in my first round, what I get in my value function is essentially just the reward function. In the second round, that information gets propagated to all the neighboring state. When I update the value function at those states, I get to observe the immediate reward, which is zero, plus some reward from the adjacent state. state. And I can also measure what we call the Bellman residual, which is the difference, the maximum difference in value over all of the states. So in this case, I have a Bellman residual that's 0.9. And if I do that over a few more iterations here, I'm at iteration number five, we see essentially the value information diffusing through the graph in terms of the structure of the state space. My Bellman residual, if all goes well, should reduce at every time step. Something to check if you're implementing value iteration. After about 20 iterations, things have gotten pretty stable. My Bellman residual is quite small. I have an estimate of the value everywhere. I don't have a policy. How do I get a policy? Not so hard, right? One version of Bellman equation, I look in every state. Should I go up or should I go left or should I go right? Because there's symmetry in my um, noise in my transition model, I can essentially always you know, go towards the adjacent square that has higher value. And we can look at that in slightly larger cases. right? This is an example where I have four different rooms. Each of them have been broken into um, 16 states or so. And I start in the first case, in the first iteration, where my goal is. 
And after a couple iterations, that information propagates, diffuses again across the graph based on the structure of the framework. Um, perhaps it's useful to think about the fact that in this case, I'm assuming that at every round, I'm doing a full estimation of the value function over all of the states at each of my iteration. Maybe that's not so useful. In particular, if you look at an example like that where the value hasn't changed anywhere else in the outer states, doing a value update in all of these other states probably isn't a very good use of your computation. So there's version of value iteration called, I'll call it asynchronous value iteration where essentially you're doing your updates in according to a priority queue, and that priority queue depends on how you visited the states before. And so we can adjust how we do this to be a little bit more efficient in some cases, particularly focusing on the states that are actually possible under some trajectory rather than trying to do that for all of the states at the same time. And if you think of a system like AlphaGo, I'm caricaturing a little bit here, but they had a lot of trajectories from expert games of Go between two human experts. And those games essentially define trajectory through the state space. And they'll spend quite a bit of time characterizing and learning those strategies in a way to control the distribution of states that you expect to see in a game and focus your learning around states along that distribution rather than try to learn uniformly for all the states, which isn't possible in a game like Go where the number of states is astronomical. Okay, this kind of wraps up my basic tutorial level on RL. If you want to know more, if this has given you just enough of a taste, there's two books that I recommend. One of them is The Basic Sutton and Barto, which most of you are probably familiar with. It's available freely on Rich Sutton's website. There's version edition number two with slightly different notation um, that is also available that is a little bit more work in progress, but sufficiently mature that you can probably use it. Alternately, as uh, Chabas Vaspari has put out a reinforcement learning textbook that I quite like also. It's a little bit more terse, a little bit more mathematical, um, but you might want to have a look at that one. Also available freely on Chabas website. So let me focus a little bit more on um, some more challenging problems that arrive. Um, I would say there's essentially different classes of challenges for reinforcement learning. One of them is figuring out how we're going to design our problem domain. So we have the problem of state representation. How do we represent our information? And that one shares a lot of similarity with um, other supervised learning problem. And I will get, I promise, to deep reinforcement learning where we throw in a neural net in this framework. And this will be where it's most useful in a sense. How do we represent the state information for a system? We also often need to choose our actions, but for today I'm going to assume that the choice of action is given by the description of the problem. Picking the right reward function can be more difficult. Often in problems in robotics, it's not so bad. There's a lot of problems in optimization, logistics, where it's not so bad also. Um, but when we tackle, for example, we do some work on using reinforcement learning to train conversational agents, AI agent with a person having a conversation, picking out the right reward signal for when did the agent say the right thing and the agent didn't say the right thing can be a lot more difficult. So we have quite a few challenges. Um, another area where there's a interesting challenges is figuring out how do we acquire the data we need for training? How do we figure out what is the distributions of states that are important? And how does that bias the inference that we're making in terms of the learning? Um, in, especially in the case of robotic system, you can have high cost actions, right? I talked about a robot, that, a flying robot that was going to explore downwards motion continuously. You really don't want to do that too often because at some point if you're crashing a robot every day, your supervisor is not going to be very happy. Um, so you have to figure out how to manage this aspect and in particular, how to deal with the cases where the reward function comes very late turns out to be difficult. Um, and the last point in terms of validation confidence measure sh shows up in some application, particular the medical application when we're trying to optimize treatments for um, different conditions. Our clinical partners often want to know what is the margin of error on that particular policy? Can I guarantee that I will not do more harm than good to my patient? And so we need to think about how we are going to do that in the framework of RL. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time because I think that's useful to you as you tackle the literature on what I'll call the RL lingo. There's a lot of words that get thrown around and they're like little signals. And if you don't understand these little signals, 
you may not be able to pick out what are the difficulties in a particular problem. And as you start designing your own RL problems, you may need to think about some of these. So I've picked out a list that I could think about. Maybe it's not an exhaustive list, but we'll try to distinguish between these things. So those of you who have seen RL may have seen some of these distinctions. And I'll try to tease apart what's the difference between these things and why does it matter and what are the things to be looking out for, depending on which of these scenarios you're in. So the first one I've already talked about, episodic versus continuous task. I would say in that particular case, the thing to be most concerned about is if you have a finite horizon, what is that horizon that you're looking for? And if you read into the literature a little bit more carefully, a subtlety that you will find is that if you are in an episodic task domain, it's actually important to keep the value function from each of your iterations separately. And when you're deploying your system to actually deploy a different value function for each of your horizon. Whereas in the continuous cast where we folded in the discount factor, you don't need to do that. You have a discount factor and you can actually maintain just a single value over all of your state at this sort of convergence horizon. But in the episodic task, if you don't maintain these separate value function at each of the rounds, then we can actually show that you're not going to obtain the best solution that you can. There's some really interesting thoughts on the continuous task case um, that have started to come out in the last year, and in particular, the notion of how to set your discount factor. For many years, we assumed that the discount factor was just given with the environment, but there's some really interesting thoughts as to setting your discount factor a little bit more aggressively during learning allows you to achieve a better bias variance trade-off in terms of your estimation of your value function. Or you, if, if you set a task, if you set a task, can't you just uh, include t as part of the state? You can include t, and that's exactly what this comes out to if you're unfolding them, yeah. Yeah, and there's actually some nice results um, also that shows that there may be some advantage when you're deploying your system to mix between these different policies. Bruno Scherrer has some nice results on that in the last few years. Okay, second useful distinction is between tabular and function approximation cases, right? The tabular case is really the case where you have a discrete set of states and you can write it out as a vector and you can have a table of your value function. The case where you have too many states to write it out is often the more interesting case. This is what we call the function approximation case and that covers both when there are a countable number but very large number of states and the case where your states are actually continuous, multidimensional. What's important in this case is that many of the theoretical properties that are shown about RL algorithms, whether it be about convergence properties or about sample complexity properties, how many examples do I need to see before I learn a good function, many of those are mostly for the case of tabular. And we have many fewer theoretical results in terms of convergence and learnability for the function approximation case. So in many cases, um, you have to be a little bit aware of this when you read some of the literature. Distinction number three, batch versus online. In the batch case, we're assuming that all of your data comes at once. So trajectories from your agent that have been recorded beforehand under some policy. You may know the policy, you may not know the policy, though you can usually estimate it from the data. So that's the batch case. Um, for many years, the community was really focused on the online learning case, really aiming towards this notion of lifelong AI agents. And in that case, the agent takes an action, we get the reward information, and we want that value estimation to be updated in real time as the information comes through. So there's sort of a cycle of acting, observing the transition, adjusting our Q function, and that cycle repeats throughout the life of the agent. And so there's a set of algorithms that are really amenable more for this online learning cases in the second online learning case. And one thing to worry about in the online learning case is really that at each round, as you're adjusting your Q function, you usually use that Q function to choose your next set of actions. So your distribution over the data changes over time in the second case in a way that you sometimes have to worry about and may not mix well with function approximation. Yeah. Would you call batch the same thing as offline? Yes, batch offline is the same thing. 
<clears throat> Let me expand a little bit more on online learning because a lot of the literature deals with this particular case. In particular, Rich Sutton has developed a very large body of work for this a case and some of the collaborators, Doina and some of the other uh, RL researchers. When you're doing online learning, you're going to get your information one piece at a time. So you're going to need to estimate your value function online. And there's different classes of method for doing that. One of them is you can treat each new trajectory as a Monte Carlo sample and essentially have a value function estimate that gets adjusted after each experience. So in this notation, V is really the, my estimate of the value function that I maintain over time. And U is really the estimate of the utility from the most recent trajectory. Now, if you recall your definition of U, U for ST is the utility, so it's the sum of rewards from the point S little t all the way to the end of that trajectory. So often you have to, if you use a true Monte Carlo approach, you have to wait till the end of that trajectory to figure out what was the utility of that and then do your update. And we have alpha, which is a learning rate in this case, so we're doing essentially a gradient update. Um, sorry, an online update on this particular uh, case. And, and, and it's not a Bellman equation in the sense, it's really just a difference equation. And in the second case, what we have, we call temporal difference learning. And the point of temporal difference learning is really avoid having to wait all the way to the end of the trajectory. So instead of looking at the error between my actual utility that I see and my value function that I'm predicting, in this case, the utility gets replaced by the sum of the immediate reward plus my estimate of the utility. And so I have in this case an update that I can apply on every time step. I don't need to wait till the end of the trajectory to do my update. This is what we call the temporal difference update, TD learning for many cases. So there's a couple different flavors of TD learning. I've given you here the equation for what we call the tabular case. So again, this is the case where you can enumerate all the states and for the version with features. So in this case, I'm assuming that I have a function that is approximating my value function. The easiest way to think about it for now is just assume that my value function is just a linear regression. So in this case, theta would be the weights on my linear regression. <clears throat> and I can actually update these weights in real time. What's interesting to note in this particular case, if you look at here, I have essentially a notion akin to the supervised loss that you've seen often. And so I have V, which is my prediction of what the value function should be at ST. And over here, I have my new estimate based on my immediate observed reward and again on the value function, but in this case at the next time step. There's a version called TD Lambda. TD Lambda takes advantage of the fact that I want to put an update based on the new information, right? In TD0, I, if I observe some salient new reward information, I only put that update at state ST. And for that update to get pr propagated to the state that I visited between, for ST, I'm going to have on another day in a different trajectory to come back again to this ST minus 1 followed by this ST. And so it's not a very efficient use of that new information. So TD Lambda essentially seeks to propagate that information to all the states you visited recently. And so there's a notion of eligibility. So you maintain an eligibility over each of the state at each time point. That eligibility decreases as a function of your discount factor and also of this factor Lambda. And so you can set in this case Lambda from anywhere from 0 to 1. If you set it to 0, you get the TD algorithm I just described previously, and if I set it to one, you can actually show that you essentially recover a Monte Carlo estimate of the uh, value function. So based on eligibility, you update all of the states that have el some eligibility greater than zero based on the new salient information from the new sample you've seen. <laughs> so this is essentially roughly the algorithm that went into TD Gammon plus some function approximation. And so it was the TD version with the feature space, and those features were not a linear regression in this case, they were a feed-forward neural network, but the correction of that feed-forward neural network at the top wasn't the standard supervised criteria, it was the TD error. So it was looking at the difference between the prediction of the value function of that network and the prediction that would be obtained from the observed reward plus the value at the next time step, again estimated by that network. <laughs> 
Any questions about the first few distinctions? Yeah? So I don't understand eligibility mathematically. What's the interpretation? Which part of it? Like oh, the, the, what, what, what is this quantity? What it's supposed to do? No, what does it represent? Mathematically. It's just the value, f the notion of eligibility, it's a, you can think of it as like a priority of how, uh, how much you should update that state. And that priority decreases over time as a factor of lambda. So usually you get it, you update all of them according to some diminishing rule over time. Okay, a few more distinctions <clears throat> to come. Um, on policy versus off policy. So I've already made the point that uh, the distribution over the data changes based on the policy that you have. And so essentially, you know, in the basic case, we assume that we have a big enough batch that it covers all of the cases. So when we've collected our batch, we've actually made sure to cover all of the different policies that we need and now we can have accurate estimates of the value of an action in a state over the whole state space. In reality, that's often not going to be the case, and so there may be some need to correct for the distribution of the policy. One simple way to do that, there's other ways to do it, but one simple way that's been, doing, that's been proposed is to actually use important sampling to reweigh the different probabilities. So in this case, I distinguish between the policy that I'm actually trying to evaluate right now, pi, and my behavior policy, which is the policy under which my data was collected. There's some challenges in applying this in practice. When your factors become too different, your importance factors get very small, you end up having high variance in your estimation. So you have to be a little bit careful. But at least I want you to be aware of the fact that if your data is collected under a particular policy and then you try to apply it in a different policy, you have to be concerned about the differences between the distribution and somehow find ways to compensate for that. And this really arises in problems where you have very large amount of exploration. So if you have a very simple domain where you can afford to try all the actions in all the different states, then it's not really a problem and you can afford to do full exploration and have in your data set enough data to characterize all the different policies. But as your policy space gets very, very large, this is what becomes a challenge. And so there's really this notion that you have to trade off between exploration and exploitation, whereas in exploration you're picking actions to gain more information but that are not necessarily optimal. You can look at your function, your value function, to see what's the best action to take, but you're not necessarily picking these best action in a way to further acquire information. In exploitation mode, you sort of say, well, I'm going to use my value function, my current estimation, to choose my actions and do it based on that. And so assuming there's enough time this afternoon, I'll talk more, I'll go at more length on exploration versus exploitation, in particular what we know how to do in terms of exploration, how to be more efficient in picking our actions to explore the domain when we can't afford to be totally exhaustive about it. Uh, the last distinction is really one between, you'll often hear distinction between model-based versus model-free reinforcement learning. Um, and I'm not gonna go at length into the pros and cons of each of these, but really point out that the model-based option is really the case where you take all of your data, similar data, data about your trajectories, and you use that data to estimate the probabilistic model and the reward model. And once you've estimated these models, you fix them, and then you run essentially planning algorithms based on these estimated models. So this would be the model-based approach, and then the model-free approach you don't worry at all about learning the correct dynamic model of your environment. You worry directly about learning either a good value or a good policy, independent of the model. And these are very gross characterization. There's methods that mix a bit of both in various different ways. Maybe the last uh, distinction is really about what we call value-based methods and policy-based method. And Peter is gonna talk about the policy-based methods a little bit later. And so today, really, what I'm talking about is the methods that use dynamic programming-like approaches and are trying to directly estimate the value function. But as we saw a little bit earlier, you can actually switch from, once you have a good value function, you can tease out a policy. And once you have a good policy, you can tease out a value function. The choice of what method to use, whether it's a value-based method or a policy-based method, 
is really, I think, related to the characteristics of your domain. So in many cases, if you have a lot more structure in your policy and it's easier to express prior information in the space of policy, then probably the policy estimation methods might be better. If you have a very small set of actions, particular small set of discrete actions, as we do in the Atari system, for example, then maybe the value-based methods are the way to go. And so <laughs> it's not a clear-cut um, sense. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there's these actor-critic methods that actually mix features of both of them, and that may well be the way to go as we move forward. There's been a lot more interest in these methods going forward. Any questions on the RL lingo? Do you see a little bit more clearly through that? Yes? Um, it really depends. Uh, the, so the question is, in the case of a conversational agent, would it be more policy-based or value-based? And I think it really depends on the structure that you want to assume for your conversation. And so if you're having a dialogue agent that can only select from a small set of specific speech acts, as has been done in the literature for several years, then the value-based methods have been reasonably successful. As we're moving towards conversational agents that are going to generate natural language, and the space of natural language is much bigger, and we're really looking more probably at architectures that are going to look like actor-critic methods, that mix some element of value function to estimate the value of the different speech acts, but that allow us to have a much more fluid notion, a much richer notion of what's our policy. Okay, so I'm assuming you have the lingo down for the most part, and you know when to worry about certain things, and in particular, once you have a problem, an RL problem you want to tackle, how to start thinking of what are the different dimensions along which you need to characterize your problem. What I want to talk about in the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes is really how do we deal with very large state spaces. So we have our Q function, and earlier on when I gave you the equation for the Q function, I wrote it out as the Bellman equation, your immediate reward, your, maximize, your, your expectation over your future state and the value of your future state. And I'm, I'm going to discuss the case where your Q function can be learned directly approximated, essentially as a rich set of functions. So here I have the linear version of it, where thetas are my weights and phi's are some kind of feature vector. And we're going to assume at first that maybe these feature vectors are given, designed by hand, features of the board. In the case of uh, TD Gammon, that was the case that there was uh, sort of a 200-dimensional input vector that where they had selected what were the right features to think about. And for many years, Computer Go was also done along these lines where they had some sense of what are the features you need to think about, right? local patches of black and white pieces, encoded and they would have a vector that describes the board in that way. So the framework for incorporating, in this case, function approximation, so large state space function approximation, but I'm going to do it from a batch case in this, is to really set it up as a supervised learning problem. So there's a family of approaches called fitted Q iteration, where as an input to your system, you have the state and action information, <laughs> As the output, you have essentially your prediction of the Q function. So the output for one particular example, your data is essentially you take your trajectory and you cut it up into these experience pieces. And each experience piece consists of a state, an action, a reward, and the next state. So that's an experience piece. And your batch is the collection of these experience pieces. And for fitted Q iteration, we're going to roughly assume that you've mixed them all up so they're not in the order of your trajectory, so they're roughly independent if your batch is big enough. So our input is your state in action, and your output is essentially the estimate of your Q function. So your immediate reward, and then the max action over the next state. And your loss is measured by the same type of loss that we were using when we were doing the TD updates. So I have my immediate reward plus my estimate of my future reward, and then I have my current estimate at S. And think of now doing linear regression or using neural networks. There's a very nice paper by Damien Ernst where he explores the use of random forests for doing this. And so what's really important to note here, I think, is the fact that your estimate of the Q function actually appears twice. <laughs> 
in your loss, right? Usually in supervised learning, you wouldn't have this term over here. If you think of a problem that has a horizon of one, you just pick one action and you observe the reward and you see whether your Q function predicts that reward. Well, you're not going to have that term over here. You're just going to have R and Q. But now I have my Q function that appears twice. And the reason this is problematic is because in the beginning, when your Q function is really poorly characterized, it means that your measure of loss is really poor and you can have instability in terms of your learning. In particular, in your case where R is very, very sparse, so think of cases where you don't get any reward all the way till the end of your Go game, like 200 moves later then all of this information in terms of trying to predict your loss is really just noise all the way till you get a reward signal. And so that learning problem is the reason why for many years trying to use neural networks to do function approximation in RL was really problematic. And it turned out there were a few people who seemed to know the magic sauce to make it work. But now we've, I'll tell you a few of these magic ingredients. So here, do you optimize only the last Q or you optimize with respect to theta appearing in the two places when you compute a gradient? Uh, uh, in this case, you just take the Q estimate directly. We don't, com I'm not making the assumption yet that we're computing a gradient. Though in some but cases you- you optimize that loss, you should with gradient with respect to all the appearances of theta in this experiment. So if you're doing it as a neural network, you compute a gradient. If you're doing it using random forest, you don't. Right? You use a different criteria for minimizing the error. And so, but if you're doing neural networks, yes, you can compute your gradient with respect to the parameters of your network using that expression. On both sides? Yes. <coughs> yeah? I think there's a paper a while ago by Ram Parr and collaborators has studies what you should optimize both paras or only one of them. And I think in his paper, the findings were it's better to just optimize one of them, not both. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll discuss it a little bit, because that was one of the key ingredients for a lot of the DQN work. And so it, just to, to go back to the arcade learning environment, because it was one of the most prominent cases of where they use function approximation. In that case, you're trying to play these Atari videos just to give you a sense of how they're doing it, they're really playing it with information at the pixel level. So they have the images frame by frame. The action set is relatively small, depending on the games. Um, but they're trying to do that for many, many different games. And so the question in this case was, how do we pick out the features? And because they're going to do that over several games, they don't want to recreate the set of features manually for all of these games. And the time was ripe for applying convolutional neural networks in this case. So their Q function is essentially the output of a convolutional neural net. In this case, I'm not going to go into the particular architecture, but you can look at the paper if you're interested. It's essentially trained with stochastic gradient descent. So they get a big batch of data with a lot of exploration, and then they train this to predict the Q function. So we can look in this case at the training score. And so it's important to know that the training score is always measured once you fixed your Q function and now you're just running it in test mode where you use that Q function to pick out the action. So you usually compare the Q value for the different actions and you pick the one that has maximal Q value. So this isn't so convenient if you have um, a continuous action space or a very large action space because you need to operationalize that maximization over the choice of action. But in Atari, it's not a problem because it's a relatively small action space. And what you see is learning curves that look a little bit like that, right? Your score goes up. In this case, we've changed the number of training episodes that are allowed. And if you look in the paper, you'll see a lot of results that look like this, where they're essentially listing all the different Atari games that they've worked on. And they compare the performance of a human player versus the AI player, and above this line are all the games where AI is better and below are the games where the humans is better. And so there's some pretty lengthy list of results. Um, what I want to emphasize in the few minutes we have left is really the useful ideas that were introduced to have stable learning in this type of architecture. Some of them had been a little bit um, announced in the literature before, but this work really crystallized the importance of them. The first one is probably the notion of experience replay. So it deals a little bit with your question of how do we get your batches of data. The notion of experience replay is that you have a very, very large batch, but every time, every round you do your Q updates, you actually sample a subset of that batch drawing randomly essentially decorrelating your samples, because your samples are obtained along trajectories. 
but you don't want to take a piece of the mini badge that all comes from one particular part of the trajectory. You want to have representation over the whole space. And so you random a mini batch of experience, do your updates using that. There's been some more recent work that shows that you should actually do a prioritized experience replay, meaning that you shouldn't sample uniformly over all of your big batch of data, but you should sample pieces in proportion to different factors. They have a few different criteria in the paper. One of them is suggesting that you should actually sample states which, where you've observed a larger TD error because these are probably the ones where your network is not doing a good prediction, so you should emphasize the training under those pieces of um, the problem. <clears throat> so experience replay seems to be quite useful. Um, a couple other useful tips for stability. Uh, one of them is gradient clipping. I'm assuming everyone is familiar with that. We've talked about it earlier this week. The other one is this notion of a periodic update, which was a little bit foreshadowed um, in previous work. And the idea is really to once periodically really fix your network of Q values. I'll call this Q theta minus. And we're going to use that network to calculate the error. So that's going to be the right side of my error equation. And then all of my updates, I th in fact, I think in this case, they're fixing both Qs in, to calculate the error. So you fix your Q for both the left and the right side. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what they do. They fix both of them, and then they apply all of their Q updates to some other network, which keeps on changing. And once in a while, after a few iterations, they take the updated network, and then they start using that as a reference network. And that seems to really be useful for stabilizing the learning. <coughs> Everyone has been using that, including in some policy search methods. Um, and the, one of the last ones is um, this work on double DQN. Essentially, there's um, a nice work by Hadovan Hasselt and some of his colleagues. This, most of this work is done at DeepMind these days, where they've shown that your Q values are actually often biased. And they're biased by the fact that in your estimate of the Q value, there's a max function. And that max is a max over Q. So if there's some error in your estimation of the Q and you take a max over that, over time you're going to introduce some bias. As your Q converges, that bias goes away. But in the early phases of learning, that can be quite problematic. And so in this particular case, they use a correction where they use a different Q function. They essentially have two Q functions in parallel. They use one to select the action and a different one to calculate the error. And so that mitigates the bias in this particular case. And if you look at the empirical results, on the top over here, I'm showing actually the value estimates with DQN and with double DQN in blue. And so you see that the standard DQN actually overestimates the value quite a bit in some of the games. Not in all of the games, but there's some games where it really overestimates the value. And if you look at the score, once you correct so in blue, again, the double DQN, once you correct for that bias, you can achieve much better performance on some of these games. And these ones essentially converge to a bad solution because their early estimates of the Q function were too biased. Uh, yeah. Slave comment. So double DQN has the same bias, only on the opposite direction, it tends to underestimate. Uh, but apparently, for some reason, <coughs> you're picking the max underestimating is not a big deal. It seems to, yeah. How's that from? And the last one, perhaps, I'll mention in terms of the tricks that seem to yield some advantage is this dueling Q network paper that was presented at uh, ICML this summer. In this case, uh, up here, I have essentially the standard DQN architecture with the ComNet structure, and at the end, you're just predicting the Q value. In the dueling Q network, you separately predict not the Q function, right? Q is state and action pair but you predict the value function, so the best of the Qs, right? V is max over Q. You predict the value function, and then you predict the advantage function. I haven't defined the advantage function, but it's in the literature going back to the early 1990s. The notion of advantage function is really the difference between your value function and your Q function. So at the best action, the advantage is gonna be zero. And otherwise, the advantage is going to be the gap between the Q value of that action and my value function. So in this network, they separately predict V and A. And then they compute Q by just adding up V and A. And there's an extra term there to constrain a little bit the equation. I've taken it out just for clarity's sake. Um, 
but the lower level of the architecture are common and just at the last level, which I think is fully connected, they separately learn V and A and the notion is that V can actually be shared across all the actions and so it's essentially like a stabilizing bias that goes into your estimation of your Q function and that again tends to produce good results. If you look at the graph, you know, this is dueling Q networks versus simple DQN and this is the whole bunch of games where dueling does better. Um, this is vanilla DQN. If you compare dueling versus the prioritized DDQN, so that has prioritized experience replay plus the double DQN, then there's a smaller number of games, but there's still some games where the dueling architecture seems to give quite a bit of a boost in this case. <clears throat> it is not all um, work in Atari. More recently, people have started looking at doing RL in Minecraft. There's some nice work coming out of uh, University of Michigan. Kwakli, Satinder Singh and their students um, had a paper. In this case, what's interesting in Minecraft versus Atari is that in Minecraft you have a restricted field of view, right? Your agent sees some local environment. In Atari you essentially see everything that you need to. So if you have the frame, you have all of the information, you don't have to deal with partial observability. In Minecraft, you do have to deal with partial observability. And so they have played with various different architectures that include convnets, but also including notions of memory and context. And context can be thought a little bit akin to attention in this particular case. And of course, as you add memory and context and more links between all this, your architecture gets richer and richer and you get better results. So if you're interested in knowing a little bit more, um, there's some online videos, there's a CICML paper, but the notion of attention and memory that they're introducing are somewhat related to the things that were discussed earlier this week. Um, so just to tell you that these ideas are permeating into the RL field as well. <coughs> There's a lot of work and attention on these uh, games. There's also people working on Mario and StarCraft and Doom. Um, it seems to be quite rich. In particular, 3D games with partial observability seem to be the next challenge for many things. Uh, I happen to think that um, it's important to work on other kinds of RL problem. There's a reason these domains, though, have really enabled us to make a lot of progress. One of them is that in all these cases, we have access to a simulator, and as I mentioned earlier, you can share that simulator between research teams. So it makes it a lot easier in terms of research progress to be able to do that. Um, many of these domains are nearly deterministic. And so again, if you don't have a lot of stochasticity over the action space, probably easier to learn. Um, and we also have a relatively small set of actions. So most of these RL results that use DQN type of architectures tend to be with cases where you have a relatively small set of actions. Otherwise, doing the maximization over the action can be problematic. Um, in terms, if you do care about real world application, I think there's really promising uh, results, in, not promising results yet, I should say, very rich uh, investigation domain on the side of conversation systems. We're doing some of that work in our lab. There's many other groups working on that. But in general, I think around NLP type of tasks, there's a lot of interesting work to be done. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap up over here and maybe we have a couple minutes for questions before coffee.